How does the internet work? Hey guys, Culture here. Today we're going to discuss how the internet works. More specifically, we'll look at how computers communicate with one another and explore the largest collection of web pages on the internet, the World Wide Web. This is our biggest challenge yet on the show, to make computer science entertaining. You really do just expect me to carry this show, don't you? You dump a grand piano and an elephant on my back and then follow it up with a cartoonish one-ton weight. And where exactly am I meant to draw the strength from to carry this unbearably boring subject? My raw talent? My comic absurdity? My enigmatic joie de vivre? Yeah, sure. Any of those work. Just stick to the script, please, Crash. There's only so much a man can take before he breaks culture. Right now, I'm like a Kit Kat. Delicious, everyone wants me, and you've got your thumbs poised, putting pressure on my back and melting my toothsome chocolate coating with your body heat. It's just a matter of time until I snap culture. Is that what you want? Is that what you want? I could really go for a Kit Kat right now, but that'll have to wait. Let's discuss how computers talk with one another. If we think of it this way, what language do they communicate in? If we go back to the earlier system of computers, we had punch cards, rectangular cards perforated with holes in select areas. The pattern of holes determined how the card was read, and each space could either have a hole or not have a hole. We call this language binary, a system in which information is represented as being in one of two states, on or off present or absent, or, in the case of computers nowadays, one or zero. A single binary digit, shortened and called a bit, can only exist in these two states. I don't think we should pigeonhole bits into two categories. I believe there's a whole spectrum of value between one and zero, and we should embrace a bit's right to exist anywhere on this spectrum. And hey, if a one wants to be a zero or a zero wants to be a one, I say we support that too, unlike our narrow-minded friend over here. Please don't bring gender into our discussion on computers. Oh God, I can see the gendered robot fan art now. Let's move on. If we put two bits next to each other, we now have four combinations. 1-1, one, 1-0, one, one, zero, zero, 1, and 0-0. Zero, zero. The more bits we add, the more information we can communicate. If we put eight bits together, we have two to the power of eight different combinations. That's 256 unique arrangements. In computing, eight bits together are called a byte, a term that may be more familiar to you. These bytes are used to represent typographic symbols, like letters and numbers, that humans understand. I should mention that there aren't always 8 bits in a byte. A byte used to be defined as having 4 or 6 bits, but it has now been standardized in most contexts to mean 8 bits. A cute little side note, we now call a string of 4 bits a nibble. If you want to always mean 8 bits, then technically you would say an octet. But you'll only be pulled up by nitpicking nitwits with nothing better to do than police what people say. That's what I'm here for. The information we communicate now often uses so many bytes that we need new prefixes. A kilobyte is 1024 bytes. A megabyte is 1024 kilobytes. A gigabyte is 1024 megabytes. And a terabyte is 1024 gigabytes. If we keep going up, we eventually hit a yotta byte, which is one trillion terabytes. That's roughly the size of the entire World Wide Web. Okay, okay, we all know about bytes. We're not idiots, you know. If it sounds like I'm going really slow and sounding condescending, it's only because I barely understand this stuff myself. But that's why we're here, to learn. And boy howdy am I looking forward to everyone telling me how wrong I am in the comments. Oh, culture! I didn't realize you were so worried. Don't worry, buddy. I'll make fun of you for being wrong long before the comments do. Yeah, thanks, Crash. Now that we know the language computers use, let's look at how they actually talk to one another. Essentially, this is done through wired or wireless signals. If you have a group of computers all connected together to share their resources, this is called a network. The easiest form of network to understand is a local area network, or LAN, which is small in scale and controlled by one organization. If you combined all these separate small-scale networks together using one common set of rules, you would create an interconnected network. Interconnected network, internetwork, internet, internet, oh my god! That's right, Crash. The internet has two basic components, infrastructure and protocols. Infrastructure is all the physical stuff. Computers, smartphones, cell towers, radios, cables, routers, servers, etc. Computers and smartphones, usually the endpoints of information, are known as clients. Servers are the machines that store all that information-y goodness we look up on the internet. 
Nodes are connecting points between clients and servers that redirect or monitor data, like routers. Protocols are the rules for how computers on the internet communicate, a logical system that allows for consistency when exchanging information. Oh, I get it. You gotta all be on the same page before you start mingling with one another. Like establishing ground rules and safe words in the bedroom before you get down to funky town. The less I hear about your nocturnal activities, the better. You can imagine that on such a huge network of computers, it could be hard to find the exact computer or server that you want to interact with. That's why every single device connected to the internet is assigned a unique internet protocol or IP address, that string of numbers you always see with dots separating them. You're probably most familiar with IP addresses of this form, where NNN can be any number between 0 and 255. Those are IP version 4 addresses. We now also use IP version 6 addresses of this form, which use a hexadecimal code where N can be any number between 0 and 9, or any letter between A and F. This allows for a huge number of combinations, 340 undercillion possible addresses, easily enough IP addresses to sustain our population for a long time. And yeah, undercillion is a word, look it up. IP addresses are assigned by your internet service provider or ISP, or in some cases they may be static. That means the device is permanently assigned a single IP address. So you're telling me I can contact any device on the internet as long as I know its IP address. Like some kind of creepy stalker who digs around in the trash to get a girl's contact details and calls them non-stop? Well, there are security measures in place. And just because you know someone's IP address doesn't mean you can mess around in their house, a uh, server. But one fun thing to do is ping a device to see if it's connected to the internet. By opening up command prompt on Windows or terminal on Mac and typing in ping followed by the IP address or domain name of the site, you can receive a report on how long it takes your ping to get there and back. It's essentially an echo request message. In my neighborhood, if you say ping around a store serving bubble tea, you get a lot of angry looks. Oh jeez, that was... That was awful. Now we know how to address our information, let's look at how we actually get a message from one computer to another. First, we need to convert our information into a palatable form for transferal over the internet. This is achieved using a protocol stack. A protocol stack is just a series of steps for converting data into packets and assigning the packets with a destination. Imagine this like sending mail. You can only send a certain amount of information in each envelope, otherwise it'll be too big for the post office to accept. On the internet, this problem is solved by breaking your information into packets. Each packet contains about 1000 to 1500 bytes, along with information for how to be reassembled with the other packets it's traveling with. This allows the packets to travel separately, yet still be pieced together when they get to their destination. Right, so kind of like if that guy who scrounged around in the trash for that girl's address now wanted to send that girl a lock of his hair that she can keep and cherish always and forever. But he can't send all of the hair in one envelope, so he sends multiple envelopes with his hair in it, plus an additional package with a recording of him singing Unchained Melody while crying softly. Just, you know... As an example? Also, if you wanted to send mail, you don't just hand the post office a blank envelope. Instead, you have to write the address on the envelope in a specific format that the postal service then interprets before sending the mail on its way. On the internet, all of this grunt work is performed by the TCP IP protocol stack, named after the steps involved. In internet terms, we call these steps layers. The Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP layer, assigns each of your packets with a port number for distribution. TCP protocols on the sending and receiving devices also chat back and forth with one another to make sure that every packet of information makes its way from one end to the other. If a packet gets lost or corrupted, the information is resent. The Internet Protocol, or IP layer, assigns your packets with the IP address of the destination computer. Your modem or other hardware then converts your binary data into a signal for transmission along wires. Once the data reaches the other computer, it travels in the opposite direction back up the TCP IP protocol stack and is stripped of all its address information before finally being converted back into a useful format. I may have left out a lot of detail there, but that's the gist. Whoa, buddy, I think you skipped a bit in the middle there. What do you mean it just travels down a wire to the other computer? What about the part in the middle where the government looks at everything I do? Well, I suppose there is a bit more to it. For starters, there are many paths your information can travel down because there are so many different devices connected to the internet. 
Routers are special devices that exist at junctions in the internet to redirect your data towards the appropriate destination. What's cool about this is that your data won't always travel down the same path when accessing the same destination. Instead, routers will redirect the data down different routes to avoid high traffic areas. This fluidity of the internet naturally combats the slowdown effect of congestion. It's also important to note that all your requests to servers must first pass through your ISP. It's at this point that your search history and spending habits can be monitored by external agencies. Those bastards! I knew it wasn't a coincidence when ads for My Little Pony started popping up. I, I mean, you watch one video of Fluttershy and Applejack on Newgrounds and suddenly they think you're a brony! Speaking of which, did you ever wonder why we have names like Newgrounds.com and Google.com and YouTube.com? This format for accessing information on the internet is all thanks to the World Wide Web. The World Wide Web is a way of organizing information on the internet such that certain text elements can be clicked on via a hypertext link to redirect you to another page. It was originally developed by Tim Berners-Lee in 1989 to help scientists share research papers. Wow, it came from such humble beginnings. Look at it now, an endless ocean of pornography with fjords of furry fetishes. Tim Berners-Lee actualized his vision of the web by developing three integral components, HTTP, HTML, and URL. Hypertext Transfer Protocol, or HTTP, is the key protocol of the web that instructs web servers and browsers to fetch web pages. Hypertext Markup Language, or HTML, is the way web pages are formatted to include different elements, like text, images, and videos. Finally, a Uniform Resource Locator, or URL, is the domain name plus the protocol identifier. For example, Google.com is the domain name, HTTP is the protocol identifier, and HTTP colon forward slash forward slash www.google.com is the URL. Furthermore, if the protocol identifier is HTTP, then the URL can more specifically be called a web address. You may have also noticed that sometimes your protocol identifier is HTTPS rather than just HTTP. The S stands for secure because HTTPS encrypts your data, making it harder for government agencies and ISPs to spy on your browsing habits. It's thanks to HTTPS that we can do our banking and shop online safely. So no one can find out about the dirty things I buy on Love Honey? No. Well, not unless you announce it in front of our whole audience. You know, like you just did. There's one more thing that makes the web possible. Domain name system or DNS servers. Every time you type in a domain name, your computer sends a request to a DNS server asking for the corresponding IP address. Imagine the DNS server as a phone book, but instead of translating people's names into phone numbers, it translates domain names like youtube.com into IP addresses that computers can more easily understand. Only after your computer receives the IP address can it then contact the web server that it needs. If they called them provinces instead of domains, then they'd be PNS servers. <laughs> Sounds like penis. Crash, please add something constructive to this video. Just once. That's all I'm asking. Ugh, fine. Wouldn't it take ages to look up the IP address every single time? Well, your computer can locally store a domain name's IP address for a limited time in a process known as caching. Using the phone book analogy, it's like if you remember a phone number because you call it frequently or just called it recently. Therefore, you don't have to waste time looking it up in the phone book and can dial straight away. Like how I know the number for Love Honey off the top of my head. Unfortunately, yes, that's a perfect example. Sometimes scammers on the internet will replace your DNS server with a fake that gives you the wrong IP address. This IP address will instead take you to a site that looks identical to the one you were expecting, but that tracks all of your information. This is one way people's credit card details and passwords get stolen. It's like if you asked a friend to look up a number for you, but he's a douche, so he tells you the wrong number, and instead you have a confusing two minute conversation with your mum, thinking it's your girlfriend. That'd totally suck, right? Yeah, it does. Trust me. Ah, good memories. But culture, you still failed to answer the most pressing question of them all. Why would I care? It seems like all the nerds and geeks have got this stuff sorted out. Why do I need to understand what goes on behind the curtains? To increase your understanding of the world, to satisfy your natural curiosity, to gain an appreciation for the systems you take for granted, so that in the future, when the internet is even more pervasive than it is now and issues of ethics arise in the public sphere, you can speak from a position of knowledge to justify your opinions? Hmm... Nope. Still not interested. See y'all next week!
If you enjoy what we do here at Culture Crash, please consider supporting the show via our Patreon, where we have a bunch of awesome rewards, or by checking out our online store. All links are in the description below.